I would take my hand and just pull the grass out. The town was kind of in a decline. The, the egg business was going downhill. It happened to be a night of the ball game, and uh, we were going to the ball game. That was the greatest uh, uh, name I think I've, I've ever heard for a sports guy. Excited they were playing a football game and it wasn't a high school game. It was kind of a way that the community gathered back together after the war. Today we're filming in the Petaluma Historical Museum and Library. And our subject of this episode is the famed football team, the Petaluma Leghorns. If you wonder why I'm standing right in front of the men's room door, you'll find out in a minute as we film this episode of Petaluma Memories. I guess in, it was in 1946, uh, Bob uh, Acorn and Gene Benedetti were talking one day and they thought, well, let's start a foot, you know, talking about a football team. Uh, and with a couple of other businessmen in Petaluma, formed the, uh, you know, got the money, or, or the, the fellows that were here, one owned a, uh, a sporting goods store and he says, well, I'll buy the uniforms and what have you and that. And they got the Petaluma Leghorn started. And they played one game in 46 and then they started with a regular season in 47. Of course, World War II had just ended in 1945, and a lot of these fellows had participated in the war and whatever, and they, you know, they'd played college football or they'd played some certain things, and they came back, and my, my uncle Shorty had this idea, well, gee, let's, because he had played football, and, you know, and, and he uh, had this idea, let's, let's get a, a team together, and because and, a lot of guys wanted to play football, and they had no, you know, they hadn't gotten it out of their system yet. The first game was played in 1946. It was an Armistice Day game, and they played the USF Frosh, and they uh, uh, lost a bit, but it was uh, the stands were packed, and uh, you know, there, it was a rural area, and there wasn't an awful lot to do uh, sometimes, so a lot of people turned out, and the response was so good that they uh, decided to continue into a full season the next year. And so Interesting. My dad's uh, and my uncle Gene or Uncle Shorty were very close, and of course, uh, when the Lakehorn started, uh, they needed some you know some funding and that type of stuff. And of course, my dad was there to help him do that and, and whatever. And my dad was also in the laundry business, and of course, he provided the towels and he washed the uniforms for the Lakehorns, and he did that for almost the whole time that the Lakehorns were in business. The town was kind of in a decline. The the egg business was going downhill and. And Petaluma just needed an uplifting, and the, and the Leghorns just became, if you weren't at the Leghorn game on Saturday night or Sunday afternoon, you weren't living. Well, when I first heard of the Leghorns, I was, uh, I can figure, I was 12 or 12 and a half years old, and, and uh, the word had gone all around town that some of the old Petaluma boys who had been in the war were back home and they were going to play a football game against the University of San Francisco freshmen and my folks took me to the game and I remember that you know we were all excited they were playing a football game and it wasn't a high school game. Dad was teaching and coaching football at Santa Rosa Junior College. He was not able to afford the things that he wanted for his family going forward and a growing family at that uh, so he was asked to come and work for Petaluma Cooperative Creamery by George Don Darrow, the then president of, and general manager of the co-op, asked my father to come to work. Dad was coaching and teaching and he wanted his career to be one of coaching football. He said no to George Don Darrow and George kept uh, 
kept the pressure up, I think, on my father to the point where dad finally came down and had a personal interview with George at the creamery, thought about it, and, and basically made an offer to my father that he couldn't refuse, and that was to come to work at the co-op. Dad left coaching, and that, that was painful for my father. But he went to work at the co-op with the promise from George Don Darrow that work would not interfere with the Lakehorns that were just being founded. And so George Don Darrow, to the contrary, said, not only will it not interfere, but if you would like me and the co-op to help you financially with the Lakehorns, we would be happy to. We would be happy to put our money and talent towards helping you out. And Dad said, no, this team will remain independent We'll have no major sponsors of any sort, and we're going to do it ourselves. We meaning the players. So it was a very democratic uh, approach to a football team. Here we are at the men's room of the Petaluma Historical Museum and Library. Come on in, I'll show you some interesting stuff. The men's room here is dedicated to the Leghorn football team. Leghorns were formed in 1946 by a bunch of guys standing around in a filling station in Petaluma. And what better mascot to have than a chicken? Cap uh, Petaluma was the chicken capital of the world at that time, and the Leghorn chicken was the number one chicken. So they chose the Leghorn. The Leghorns were an amazing success right from point A. Sold out in the first game in November of 1946. Soon they had 4,000 people attending. Mind you, that's in a town of just 10,000. Amazing success. The Leghorn individuals who played on that team went on to be big business successes as well. And they wore these leather helmets. Now, th these were discontinued in the 1950s. What a success, 90 wins, only 32 losses and three ties in their 12 years. And I might add, juvenile delinquency in Petaluma went down during those years, during the fall of those years. Great team, the Leghorns, they helped everything. It was an effort that was a joint effort. Gene Benedetti was the coach, but no one got on the team unless they were elected or voted in by the other players. And so it was a cooperative. There was no doubt that Gene Benedetti was the boss and later Don Ramazzi was the boss. They ran the football team, but it was very democratically run. Uh, I had known Gene Benedetti since I was a small boy. And I came down and, and told him I would like to play for him and that, and he said yes, and so I started playing for the Leghorns. And I played for them uh, from 1949 uh, 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 to 1950, uh, through 54. And it was one of the, uh, uh, the uh, best periods of time in my life. We always had, uh, you know, like Penaluma, every game, was played in Petaluma except maybe two or three uh, in two years because Petaluma drew 5,000 people or more. You know, they, we, it was all the stands were full of people. There were people lined up all around the football field to see us play. During the war, there was a lot of time between invasions. And that time, my father used to hone his skills on football from a coaching perspective. And he had playbooks of plays that he had worked on and developed well on R&R, &R, if you will, between invasions of North Africa, Sicily, Salerno, Anzio, and finally, Normandy. Between those invasions, there was time, and that's where he dedicated to learning uh, more and more about football. Now we played on that field in one game. It was so wet. Let me tell you what happened. During the week, the crew at the high school thought we were through with the football season, and we weren't. So they spread chicken manure all over the field. And, that, and the water was on the field was in places a half an inch deep and that. And to be able to get your, and muddy, it was muddy. That was the picture you see in there with all the mud on the guys, and that, that was it. And, that, and to be able to get my foot in solid ground, I would take my hand and just 
pull the grass out and the dirt and put my foot down in it so I'd have at least one leg to, to shove off on, you know. And that, and oh, that laid, uh, uh, Dan LaBarley's father afterwards had to take all those uniforms, the, the shoulder pads and everything, and take them down to the laundry. He did all that for us. That was his donation to the Leghorns. He washed those uniforms and that, so forth. And that, and that day, man, he had he had the back of the truck full of, of them and, and cleaned them all up, and we had, had them the next time we played. Well, yeah, because that was a big job for us, the... the um, uh, uh, the water boys because we were constantly running on the field just wiping the, the players faces off and getting the mud out of their eyes and trying to clean their cleats and and whatever I mean it was you talk about a mud bowl it was the mud bowl I mean and the fans they couldn't believe it I mean the players would run and you'd see the the, the water splashing out of you know out of the ground and whatever and at the end of that game there was no grass left in that field it was just the mud bowl there was another game in the Leghorn history around the same time called the Mud Bowl where you couldn't even see the players' uniforms. They were all covered with mud. I forget who that was with, but everybody attended the game anyway. <laughs> I remember we were going up there to play in a big game, and, and uh, <laughs> so we go up there to look at the field, and, and what had happened is he, they, they always said that they left the sprinkler on at the field but really nobody left the sprinkler on they were out there and soaked the field you know so when we got up there to play the game they, they the, the players just had regular cleats on so then they had to um, George Norwood had to run out and but see if he could find this is on a Saturday afternoon see if he could find mud cleats in a sporting goods store well he found a few or whatever so then we gradually changed the uh, uh, the the regular cleats to the mud cleats but uh, that, unfortunately, forty. I mean, the Lakehorns lost that game. Yeah, boy, there was a lot of friction after that too, though. But that was a fun day, fun day. Yeah. I remember one year they went up there to play, and it hadn't rained in Petaluma for sixty, ninety days, and the field was soaked with water. And I think they'd run the sprinklers all night long, but they all came with long mud cleats, and we had the regular cleats in our shoes, and, and somehow we lost the game, and so that went on and on and on. <laughs> I thought that it was going to be a war between Petaluma and Santa Rosa. And in fact, uh, the Falco, uh, Bob Falco, was play uh, Pete Falco was playing for the Bone Crushers, and I knew him well. He worked here in Petaluma at Hunt and Barron's, and we argued about that for 25 years after, that that was a set-up deal. <laughs> he denied it, but... <laughs> Something had to happen at that field to be so full of water. Well, yeah, they had, uh, every year they had the Egg Bowl charity game. And uh, they raised a lot of money for charity every year. I mean, they had so many people coming from all over. And it was well, not just Petaluma, but it became the event. Everybody donated their time and their goods, for instance, the refreshments and so forth. Everything was donated. The Petaluma High School did not charge any rent for the Egg Bowl, and every penny went to charity. They gave, I remember reading the, the amounts they had given. After a few years, they had given $17,000, which in today's dollars would be over $100,000 to charity. It, it represented a a substantial amount of money. Uh, Gene Benedetti would come and say, look, they have a people that uh, need a hospital bed, uh, and we're going to, uh, we'd like to uh, purchase that bed for the people. Uh, and we'd say, sure, you know, the money's there. If you have the money, spend it, buy it. And we had uh, uh, one of the, um, uh, just a minute now, uh, um, uh, storage, storage van people who, <clears throat> the equipment, <clears throat> the equipment we bought, beds, bedside tables, uh, chairs, uh, et cetera, and that, and uh, hospital equipment that he had kept that in his storehouse. And <clears throat> all we had to do was call him, and he, he would take it out and put it in the, uh, in the person's house, uh, a bed or whatever it was, and when they were through with it, he'd go get it and bring it back and store it for us. And that was one of the big things that was really that we did for the community. They bought hospital beds and you know whatever, and they bought an iron lung that went to the Petaluma General Hospital, and we, 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 that money would go back into the community. And I, I think you know we did a really good job there.
They contributed a lot of community spirit and a lot of the people who played on the Leghorns turned out to be movers and shakers in, in Petaluma for many years afterwards. And uh, it was kind of a, um, it seems to me looking back on it now, it was kind of a way that the community gathered back together after the war, kind of a, a reunification process or something like that, and kind of began to give the community some focus. The fabled quarterback of the Leghorns, Fred the Fox Clemenock, uh, was the greatest uh, uh, name I think I've, I've ever heard for a sports guy, Fred the Fox. You know, I played with Fred at, at the University of San Francisco and he was, he was a great athlete. He was a, a good runner and he was an excellent passer and uh, he was a top-notch quarterback and he really made the Leghorns as good as they were because you know the quarterback is a key element in, in your football game and when Fred came to the Leghorns uh, our standing really went up and and then he, he, he got called back into the Marines for a year or two and, and then we had a struggle a little bit and then he came back and when I was coaching in 1952 he had just come back from the Marine service and and I think we won 10 games and lost one, and he, he was a very, very instrumental in our success. He, he, he was probably one of the better quarterbacks in the semi-pro league. Around. He had been in the Marine Corps, and uh, uh, he knew what leadership was. He talked in the huddle, and you kept your mouth shut. <laughs> and uh, uh, he could throw that ball, uh, and uh, he put on a lot of yards. Uh, one uh, year, I forget what it was, I think around 50 or there, uh, we were the second highest scoring team in the nation. And uh, Fred was throwing the ball. Well, I gave him the name Fox when we were down at USF because he had a real pointed nose and he's got a narrow head. And, and I used to kill him. I said, you look like a fox to me. And he was foxy running the football team. So I, I actually gave him the name Fox, Freddie the Fox and I stuck with him for the rest of his life. Most teams are named after ferocious names, you know, like the Lions and the Tigers and the Windbreakers and the this, that, and the other thing, you know, and here we have a chicken. And, you know, boy, we got a lot of Snickers throughout the world, but... Uh, <laughs> All you got to do is just knock a lot of those people in their butts, and we did that. And we, we, we won by big margins, and it shut a lot of people up. <laughs> and it, but it was fun. It was, we didn't care if we were named after a chicken or not. Uh, the rivalry, the, the one that was always important to us was beating Santa Rosa. Uh, and especially after the, uh, uh, in, in 48, uh, upset the Leghorns, uh, playing Santa Rosa was a must win. <laughs> and uh, I, I don't think that they ever beat us again in those years. There might have been once, but uh, that was important. And then the big teams that come out of Los Angeles, Eagle Rock uh, Athletic Club uh, in Los Angeles, who had uh, <clears throat> on the roster the boys from UCLA, USC, uh, and the big junior colleges down that way, uh, that was a big one, and that. And then, there, of course, there was the South San Francisco Windbreakers uh, a team down there that uh, that was always a tough game. In fact, we lost a couple of, I, I think, a, a lost one and tied one uh, to the uh, 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 South San, San Francisco Windbreakers. They always had good teams, and that was a big rivalry. Oh, there was one in San Francisco uh, called Horse Trader Eds, and he was a big used car salesman down there. And he would go around and he would uh, uh, scout up the college kids and say he would pay them uh, $125 a game if they would play for him. And, that, and they came up and uh, tried to beat us and that. They weren't very successful. I personally, you know, I, I, I didn't, you know, I knew it was, you know, people were really enjoying it, but I didn't realize what a 
serious function it was in the lives of, of many people in Petaluma. You know, they, we had a lot of fans. It, it, they just waited for the Saturday night or Sunday afternoon game. And, and I think it gave them a feeling of togetherness and purpose and something to look forward to for the weekend. And, and in that respect, I think the Leghorns really felt a needed function, filled a needed function. I hardly ever missed a Leghorn game when I had the Leghorns. In fact, when we had, uh, we built our home here uh, uh, in, in what, 50, 47, and uh, some friends were going to give us a housewarming, and uh, it happened to be the night of the ball game, and um, we were going to the ball game. We did, of course, we didn't know about the housewarming. It was going to be a surprise, and. Uh, Somebody come over and get us, says, come over to our house and we'll have a drink or something before you go to the ball game. And they were just trying to get me out of the house so they could get everything ready. And uh, we insisted on going to the ball game and he tried to, his darndest to keep us from going. He wanted to do this and wanted to do that. And I said, no, we're going to the ball game. So we went up to the ball game and, uh, and finally they had to come up in the grandstands and get us to come home for our own party. It's kind of my opinion that the um, major impact that the Leghorns made on the town was getting the town on the map. You know, it really did. People in San, in San Francisco and, and the East Bay and that knew, and further north, Eureka, whatever, knew of the Petaluma Leghorns and the reputation they had as a football club. And they brought, uh, as they say, thousands of people in here to town to see the games. And that was, and the Petaluma community, as I said before, was uh, not in the best of shape at that time. And all these people coming in meant meals and and buying stuff, etc. Sometimes you find yourself in the perfect time and place, and uh, it may be in business that that happens, or it may be in some other way. And and Petaluma, it was the perfect time to have a team. They were successful. Uh, in the year 1947 and on, people came out and, and that lasted for at least five or six years. There was an Egg Bowl game and people really set their schedules around the Leghorn. It was kind of a gradual decline of the team. Um, I think it got in, in maybe the last year, they, they even had to cancel some games for the simple reason that they, there was not the interest anymore, they didn't have the, enough players to play the game. So it was, a gra it was a gradual progression. I think the last big year might have been 56, maybe. I had played for, uh, oh, 1955 and 1956, which weren't very successful years, and they played for 1957 and 1958, and again, there, was, there wasn't any money to operate, people weren't going to games, so, uh, you know, we had passed, passed, passed the time where it became so important and we thought, oh, okay, it's gone, we realize it. And we were all watching the 49ers on television then. <laughs> that that kind of took its place. For those of us who know the Petaluma Leghorn team, the name Gene Benedetti is primary. Gene was the inspiration, he was the coach, he played on the team too. Gene Benedetti donated his personal scrapbook to the Petaluma Museum, and we have that here. I'd like to show you something. Here's a program from the Petaluma Leghorns 1950 game. Price of the program, only 10 cents. Price of the ticket, a dollar and a half. The Leghorns practiced at McNear Park here in Petaluma, and they played their game at the Petaluma High School football field, which was called Durst Field. Very fortunate to have a place in which to play their games, and because of that, they hosted most of the games. A lot of the teams coming in were military teams, and the Leghorns ran up such scores as 77 to nothing, uh, 58 to nothing, and when they beat the, the Oakland All-Stars 101 to zero, it made national news through San Francisco radio personality Ira Blue, who was a big fan. Imagine, 101 to nothing, just a bunch of guys getting together in a service station, and they formed a team so powerful. Dad was very, uh, always accessible. 
he was a public person. He loved people. And as a result, he turned down very few uh, offers for uh, interviews. He turned down very few offers for help. So it worked both ways with Pops. Pops, I remember an interview that he had with Gay LeBaron years ago. Gay and Dad were very close. Talked to him about life, talked to him about the war, talked to him about the Lakehorns, talked to him about Petaluma, talked to him about family. Gay talked to him about everything. Now, you, nobody has been more community-minded than you have. Um, you that's, obviously have a sense. That's a little overrated, I think. No. I, I'm sure I'm... Mom and Dad always told us we have to give back to this country what we take out of it. And believe me, they meant it. Because they loved this country. True and true. Oh, I just... Here they were foreigners. You know, when we went to school, we couldn't speak English. All three of us, we didn't know how to speak English because we spoke Italian all the time at home. Every night, every day, and when friends would come over, if they were, we were at home, and they sat down at the table, we still spoke Italian. Because that, my mom and dad spoke English, but very brokenly and very little. And great people. But, so they, they indoctrinated us with this feeling that we had to give back because this country had been so good to them. It seemed like everyone that played belonged to sort of a brotherhood. And we had a mutual respect whether you were playing now or you did play. After every game, there was always a big party down at Gelardi's, at Gelardi's uh, bar, and he'd have a nice spread of food, and we'd go down there and have a great time. Gene Benedetti was probably one of the finest men you'll ever meet. He, he's so congenial, so at ease with everyone. Uh, all the women were hun and all the men were buck. He didn't have to remember your name. He knew so many people. There I was, a kid, and uh, I was covering this for the regional newspaper, and it was very exciting. The people I got to know, the people, whether they were actually players or uh, staff or fans, just uh, you know, neat people. And they were on your side and you're on their side. And, and it, it's something that um, didn't go away. <laughs>